We welcome your questions. You can always submit them to us via email, questions at WLL.com. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Jeffrey Hesler is the Chief Technology Officer of Virginia Dios and has a visiting position in the University of Virginia. For more than 25 years, he has been working on creating new technologies that utilize the terahertz frequency bands for scientific, defense, and industrial applications. He has published over 200 technical papers in journals and international conferences proceedings. He's a member of IEEE Technical Committee, MTT21, the Terahertz Technology and Applications, and is a co-editor of the IEEE Transactions on Terahertz Science and Technology. Terahertz systems based on his innovative designs are now used in hundreds of research laboratories throughout the world. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to Terahertz Technology the move from scientific to commercial applications, 6G, space, and more with Jeffrey Hesler. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you today? i doing well, thanks. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction there. You're Hope welcome. If I can share, let's see if this works, and let me know if you have any issues, but I'm going to go ahead and share, and that sh you should be seeing my screen. Yes, I do. Thank you. All right, super. We'll go ahead and uh, start the talk then. Great. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a talk today um, focused on kind of terrorist technology and kind of some of the things that uh, that uh, at Virginia Dias that we've kind of seen as exciting as um, the field is kind of moving from this kind of heritage of scientific applications into more commercial uh, the applications and give some examples of those and kind of show where we, uh, the, the role we're trying to play in this in this field. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, so again, a brief introduction um, uh, and then I'll focus on two particular scientific applications, ALMA, and a radiometer, a, a satellite mission called IceCube. Then look at briefly at some commercial applications that we feel are really kind of moving the field forward. Go into terahertz test and measurement, which is our main uh, kind of area within this field, and then end with some conclusions. So scientific applications, there's been a um, uh, Basic science has really been driving the terahertz field for more than 100 years. Things like astronomy, physics, chemistry, fusion, plasma, plasma diagnostics, shown the ITER experiment here, an early representation of it, where the uh, uh, these fusion plasmas uh, use diagnostics at pretty much every wavelength you could imagine. Um, here, there's a low field side reflectometer, 50 to 170 gigahertz, the electron cyclotron emission radiometer, in the 110 to 260 gigahertz range. There's plasma density measurements at 2.5 terahertz. So lots of terahertz goes into this big science application. Molecular spectroscopy, here's a here's a, a spectrum of methanol where what looks might look like noise. Each of these is a spectral, a very narrow kind of tens of kilohertz wide, uh, low pressure uh, at, at, for a molecule, low pressure look at the uh, methanol gas here. And so again, a very, uh, a uh, rich uh, area for doing kind of chemical and biological detection uh, uh, of species out in the out in the world. Um, Alma um, is one we worked on uh, for quite a few years. Um, Alma is an array of 66 telescopes. It's on a 5,000 meter plateau in Chile, with frequency range covering from about 100 to 1,000 gigahertz. Um, a grand opening in 2013, and it's been kind of doing a lot of it, very exciting science then, since then. You might have seen this. This was some from some years back, uh, four or five years ago, I believe. This is looking, because of it's a focal plane array with a very large spacing between the, the, the a very, very large distance uh, from the, the furthest telescopes, you can get very high angular resolution. So this is actually looking at a, a, a the gas uh, uh, cloud around a star, and you can see the, the Dark areas are where planets are being formed out of this dust floating around this uh, this star. 
and with this very, very high spectral resolution. So there's, they've now imaged many, many of these uh, protostellar disks and, and recently even were able to see a moon forming around a planet, which was pretty cool. Um, the more famous image was uh, fr from a year or so ago was the, the Event Horizon Telescope Project, which did the black hole images. This is a more recent one where there's actually putting in polarization dependence, and so you can kind of see the swirling of the material into the black hole, um, and ALMA was part of that. Um, so, so with that long heritage of, of use of terahertz, what about applications beyond science? Um, people have known uh, and been excited by terahertz since at least the 50s, probably earlier, but things like uh, the, the basic kind of things that people would consider doing in terahertz have been known for, well, concealed weapons detection and passive imaging, weather forecasting, radar type systems, chemical biological hazards, uh, medical diagnostics, all these have been known about and thought about for many years. And so then the uh, so concealed weapons detection is, is one that's, um, uh, has, uh, this is an example from this uh, uh, group uh, through vision in the United Kingdom, where they're now looking at doing passive imaging of in this case, a knife. So uh, there's a big long knife here. Apparently, there's an issue in the the, the subways in London where there are people are carrying these uh, knives around, and they're trying to figure out ways to detect these. And so the city of London did a test of terrorist technology to use that to detect this uh, this uh, threat inside the subways. And so so that's something being uh, at actively tested out in the world again an example of terahertz where it's it's really being used and i think this sort of a thing is going to be used more and more and particularly in public transit transport and areas like that so um so then the question is if we've known about it since the 50s why are terahertz applications uh, starting to take off now um the uh, there there are a lot of challenges obviously with terahertz atmospheric attenuation and then uh, in particular, techno technological limitations of the terror sources and detectors. Um, but there's been a lot of technological progress uh, since the 50s. Um, one of the key ones is modern computing power. Um, just the ability of modern computers really changes the game a lot. There was actually work many years ago at Hewlett Packard trying to do gas uh, detection similar to the spectroscopy I showed earlier. Um, and what they had the technology to do the detection, do the measurements, but what, what limited them really was the, 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 the relatively primitive uh, state of computing power. And so the ability to have these modern computers is really a key enabler for the terahertz field. Um, progress in Shockey technology, there's been a lot of work on that uh, with uh, uh, these kind of systems working up to many terahertz of frequencies. Um, and then, uh, the, probably the most important is this rapid progress in transistors over the past few decades in a variety of materials, um, different variety of different semiconductor materials, and and uh, and so with now transistors, this is an 850 gigahertz uh, transistor shown in the upper right, but also kind of six, uh, 60 gigahertz and lower frequency transistors here, um, but gain all the way above one terahertz, and uh, and so the opening of of, of of these new capabilities using these amplifiers is really uh, 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 really crucial for kind of opening up this field to more general use beyond scientific, and it is a key to to, to, to that. The um, one as one example of this, this is from a few about five years ago, a little more than five years ago now, um, which I thought was particularly exciting is a silicon germanium spectrometer, so uh, 500 gigahertz transmitter and receiver that were used uh, to detect acetonitrile in, in uh, some sort of relatively low pressure, and with the goal being a compact and portable chemi chemical and biological detection system. And so there's, just to see this sort of uh, application, there's been a lot of interest in this because there's a really strong ability of uh, terahertz to uniquely identify uh, molecules. Uh, and so that's something that's, uh, uh, I think, really exciting moving forward. Um, so VDI, um, we're a small company um, where our prime focus has always been ter terahertz technology. Um, we've uh, mostly focused on scientific applications, 
um, basically with the goal being to extend the range of traditional microwave electronics using these nonlinear Shockey diodes. So I've got a picture here. I'll go into a little more detail in a minute. Um, then these waveguide mixers and multipliers. So it's taking this Shockey diode technology, which is what, what our prime uh, focus is, and then using that to take microwave instrumentation, uh, different signal generators and analyzers at microwaves up to say 40 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz, and then use that to extend those in, in, with high sensitivity and hopefully high power into the terahertz region. So here's a, an image of a weather satellite that I'll be talking about a little bit later, a, 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 a satellite looking at uh, uh, trying to improve weather forecasting um, that we did some years back at 874 gigahertz. Um, Shockey diodes, um, this is a scanning electron micrograph of one of those. They're very uh, simple device, uh, the majority carrier, but they have cutoff frequencies to many, many terahertz, uh, three terahertz, even up to five or 10 terahertz. Um, they're well modeled by relatively simple I, uh, uh, IV and CV equations, and we just use the nonlinearity of these de devices to either frequency multiply or frequency mix, so just classic heterodyne mixing. Uh, we have a well-developed fabrication technology at Virginia Diodes, where we use an air bridge, so you can see the finger here. Gaia marcinide is kind of uh, under there, and there's air under the finger, so an air bridge type technology to reduce the parasitics in this device. And that low parasitic capacitance is key for operation at terrace because that capacitance will just quench your signal and, and shunt out all the desired signals. So, so that's kind of the workhorse of our technology. Uh, for our fabrication, um, in this case, this lower picture here you can see is a diode. This is a terahertz diode where the, the substrate thickness is uh, of order about four microns. So very, very small devices to get to these high frequencies of operations. We have a wide variety of devices that we fabricate, a small captive clean room. We do flip chips and then these integrated type structures where the diodes are integrated with the coupling circuit. Um, so using those, um, we take the diodes, mount these into uh, waveguide housings typically. Um, we use waveguide largely because it's a relatively low loss transmission line structure. So microstrip at 600 gigahertz might be uh, around a dB per millimeter for typical microstrip. Um, and uh, whereas waveguide is about a tenth of that, uh, so below a tenth of a dB per meter at 600 gigahertz. So even though that's still relatively lossy, um, compared to microstrip, it's much better. So we do our best to kind of come in waveguide, get out of, uh, go be in and out of microstrip as quickly as possible to reduce these losses. Um, that's something that's changing now as, as the amplifiers are coming on, which once you have gain, then a lot more things become possible. So. Um, Split block designs, we just kind of put the diodes uh, in a, the middle of two blocks, sandwich it together, and with that we can do uh, frequency multipliers. So here you can see a frequency doubler, uh, output power at 200 gigahertz and then 100 gigahertz, and we try to be very efficient at doing this multiplication. Um, so, so using these as our basic building blocks, we combine together, say, a low frequency synthesizer, say 20 gigahertz, with uh, three multipliers, amplifiers, um, and then finally the Shockey multipliers and generate as clean of a tone up at the terahertz as we can. Um, we try to generate as much power as we can in a single tone, and we do this by using uh, both filtering and also balanced designs. The design I showed here, this is what's called a balanced doubler design, and so there's the, the intrinsic symmetries of this structure help reduce the unwanted harmonics and, and prevent them from flowing in the in kind of the wrong direction the direct flowing and so that helps to keep the signal relatively pure spectrally um, so one of the key issues with shocky diodes is they don't produce gain and so amplifiers are really a key to uh, getting good power and bandwidth and so the higher as the amplifier performance improves that just gives us better terahertz performance and gives us better wall plug efficiency something which can be important for certain applications um, and so um, the amplifiers are something we've been doing a lot of work on this is some work with teledyne where uh, this is a kind of a state-of-the-art uh, uh, 125 to 185 gigahertz uh, power amplifier uh, from teledyne these are 20, uh, 250 nanometer indium phosphide HBT technology. 
Um, we've worked to package these and been able to get very good on uh, in package performance, very similar to the on wafer. And I've showed the performance of one of these devices, uh, package devices in the lower right, where over this 110 to 170, we're getting kind of upwards of 17, 18 dBm of output power saturated and um, very nice uh, bandwidth. And we, we now have these amplifiers uh, all the way up to about 250 gigahertz. Um, and so using these, this really allows us to get dramatically higher power up in the terahertz frequency. So this is a, a an example of an amplifier in the 75 to 110 gigahertz range with more than 100 milliwatts of output power. Um, and using that, we drive one of our frequency multipliers, similar to what I showed before, um, where you just send in, you connect this uh, amplifier to this this uh, tripler in this case. And we can get somewhere from six to eight uh, dBm of output power across a full band without any tuning, just change the frequency and the output signal will track. Um, and we've seen, uh, and so this was about a seven dB improvement over in output power over pre our previous generation. So have the addition of these amps to our technology base has really helped uh, VDI uh, with uh, improving performance and getting more power and, and more bandwidth. Um, and then finally, taking these, uh, you could package these type of devices up, these amplifiers and multipliers, and then just use them with, let's say here, a standard signal generator. So, so again, taking standard microwave technology and just extend, extending it up into the terahertz as efficiently as we're able. So now I'll focus on a few scientific applications. These are kind of, again, the heritage of, of, of our company, Virginia Diodes. The ALMA project is one that we worked on from the very start of our company. Um, and uh, the uh, for the ALMA development, it's, again, these bands all the way from around 100 gigahertz up to about a terahertz, um, covering each of the atmospheric windows. So here you can see in this graph the atmospheric transmission. Um, and so these various window bands, you can see here at the uh, big null here, the 557, there's a big water line there. Um, 752, there's another big water line. And so wherever you can kind of see through up to the uh, up out of the atmosphere, the astronomers want to, to measure at all these different uh, frequencies because there's very interesting uh, science to be learned uh, across this whole spectral range. Um, there were two receivers for each band and so you can see some of the different bands here. And, and at VDI, we worked on the local oscillators to drive these superconducting SIS receivers, which have near quantum noise limited sensitivity, which helps the speed up the observation time. And so they can do mapping and, and do, do measurements of very weak lines. So there are about 14 VDI multiplier chains in each antenna. So if you look at one of these antennas, uh, you have a uh, the, the main dish and then Focusing up uh, the subreflector here, and then down, kind of in the main cabin here, is this uh, this array of different um, radiometers to uh, to do the uh, 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 to to do the uh, analysis of the signals coming in from the the objects you're looking at in space. And so, inside that doer, uh, you have something like this. There's a warm cartridge assembly sitting at room temperature, and then you've got this cryogenic front end with the local oscillators kind of hidden inside here. There's some amplifiers uh, in this, uh, some W-band amplifiers, and then the cryogenic front end sitting at 4 Kelvin to do the uh, very sensitive detection. Um, at the start of this project, uh, the most of the uh, terrorist multipliers would use mechanical tuners, things like this. You'd have a gun oscillator, you'd have all these micrometers, and that would be how you would generate terahertz power, but this is operating on a 5,000 meter plateau, so you, there can be no tuners, you need rugged components, and so we developed these broadband uh, components to uh, work with these broadband amplifiers that were developed back then to generate these signals fully electronically, uh, where it can be fully electronically controlled through, uh, through computer. Um, this is an example of 40 of the, uh, the band seven triplers, to 280 to 360 gigahertz. So you can see there's a spread, but these are all much higher than specification. And so we, we did a lot of work developing these, testing these over, uh, over temperature and, um, 
lots of sweeping. We develop, deliver these in a relatively short time frame with good repeatability um, without having to keep tweak, tweaking them or tuning them up. Um, this is the uh, final view inside the doer. This is a very large doer. It's uh, I forget exactly the size, but you kind of see a person in the upper left here. So this is me, uh, more than a meter across um, with all 10 of the uh, all the different bands sitting inside here. Um, you can see a few in a few cases horns poking out, which is what's looking up through uh, through the telescope off into the sky. And then uh, that's what uh, is producing these images. And so that's a project that uh, we were excited to work with and, and did a lot of work. Uh, but again, that, that's kind of uh, from some years back. Um, second terrorist application I'd like to focus on is the ice cube radiometer. Um, CubeSats, small nano satellites, they can be as small as 10 by 10 by 10, which is a very small. Um, 3U is more typical, a little larger, where you have basically have three of these 10 centimeter cubes kind of put together, so 30 by 10 by 10. And this was done in collaboration with NASA Goddard as, as part of a, 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 a push to try, to try to use this new technology and see what can be done from a scientific uh, application. Um, there's a lot of interest now in doing constellations of these CubeSats for doing uh, uh, extreme weather events where you can uh, you can update things very rapidly with these these satellites. Um, so for this project, CubeSat, uh, it's an eight 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 eighty three gigahertz radiometer, um, and uh, where it's looking down and the, the at basically at the ice crystals in the um, in the submillimeter so range are going to be these these upper atmospheric ice crystals at this kind of ten kilometer level. Um, it's something very difficult to see using other technologies, visible and infrared, can't really see it. The, the millimeter of a microwave sounders can't see it. So it's a very unique and you can learn a lot about the, the what's happening uh, from a weather perspective in this upper atmosphere by you looking at this very high frequency. And so there's been a lot of interest in, in, in looking at this to better understand the, the air currents and what's happening in the upper atmosphere. Um, so the, the, the satellite, uh, Kind of spin goes around the Earth and kind of spins, and then kind of gets uh, essentially a map of 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 the uh, these these ice crystals, the brightness temperature of these ice crystals. Um, there are a lot of uh, mass, volume, and power constraints for these. Um, Submillimeter wave local oscillators can consume quite a large amount of DC power, so we had to do a lot of work to reduce to use very high efficiency components and to try to use amplifiers as, at high of a frequency as possible to reduce the, the DC power constraints and improve the wall plug efficiency, and then integrate things together to reduce the mass and volume so that it would fit in this small space. Um, this is the a schematic on the right here, or a, a photograph on the right here of, of this 874 gigahertz receiver that we built, a 25 gigahertz local oscillator, uh, pre multiplier and a driver to 73 gigahertz, and then the 874 gigahertz receiver with some Baractor multipliers to drive the mixer there. Uh, and again, reduce the DC power requirements. And you can see a schematic on the left here um, of the system. Um, there's one of the challenges with working in a CubeSat is it that you can run into quite large uh, changes in temperature as you go in and out of the sun. And so we did a bunch of testing over temperature to make sure that the system would work over uh, a temperature range. So here, testing from roughly zero to 40 Celsius. And you can see the this flight model two worked quite well all the way up to 40 gigahertz, whereas flight model one, uh, somewhere after around 30 Celsius started to, to kind of fall off in sensitivity. And so that's something we were actively working to try to improve the, uh, to reduce the sensitivity of the performance of the unit to this temperature variation and allow it to be used more, uh, allow for better use in, in this kind of tough uh, thermal environment where the satellite's going in and out of the sun. So in the end, we were able to achieve the, uh, the noise temperature uh, uh, goals of, of the project, which are, were enough to give, allow them to, to do, to have enough signal to noise to be able to do the, the imaging they wanted to do in, in the required time. And it, very importantly, we were able to take the DC power to get uh, below four watts required for this whole system, and that fit within the, the power budget of the, the satellite. Um, 
This is a, a picture during the assembly of the CubeSat. Um, so you can see our components are up at the uh, top here, uh, horn, frequency horn here, and then a lot of the other control electronics and things like that for the satellite down below, the communications and all, and all that sort of stuff. Um, this was the satellite being launched back in 2017 um, from the, the space station, um, along with uh, 16 other CubeSats, and then a few other days, and, and obviously there's more and more of these CubeSats uh, heading up into space these days. So, um, And first light, um, they were able to turn it on and get a very nice uh, uh, contrast between the Earth and space. And so the, everything looked good and using that over some time, they were actually, the, 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 it was mainly a technology demonstrator to in, increase the technology read, readiness level of the technology, but they were able to get some very interesting science looking at the, um, the brightness of these ice crystals, kind of mapping that across the earth and, and uh, learn some interesting uh, aspects of, of that upper atmosphere, which hadn't really been studied before, so. Great. So, so that that's kind of the heritage of this scientific um, work, um, uh, which has kind of driven the terahertz field for many years. And but now we've got these commercial applications, and and the one which I'll probably focus on most today. I, I showed the the uh, we uh, concealed weapons detection before some other, uh, but the one that's really heating up at the moment is the six G communications. The uh, five G is still being defined now. Um, but the 6G is, is really, uh, uh, there's a large amount of interest in 6G, uh, kind of loosely defined as above 100 gigahertz. There's uh, many, many companies and countries all interested. China's uh, launched the first 6G test satellite, um, but lots of other uh, countries and companies really interested, including large names, things like yeah, Ericsson, Intel, Sony, NTT, Intel, all interested in using this technology. Um, some of the proposed applications, micro and macro cell backhaul um, events, so it's like sporting events, like the, the so large football game or a baseball game, ports ranging from airports to uh, shipping, uh, to, to, to ocean ports, uh, and then fiber closure is one of the classic ones um, just for short haul, uh, to, to send short haul high data rate signals um, rather than uh, in installing fiber. Um, the World Radio Communication Conference and at the end of 2019 actually made fixed and mobile allocations all the way up to 450 gigahertz. And so, I mean, there's there's real uh, active interest in this with, with, again, a lot of active work. But this is clearly very, very early stages. Any product <laughs> that would be 6G is not really expected to appear before at least 2030. And so there's still... Uh, so these are still in the early stage R&D, but the, I think the promise is so large of, of the, the amount of bandwidth is just so exciting that, that people are really pushing that. And so you can see that in this graph here, um, D-band here uh, going uh, up to 170 gigahertz. So you can see some of these atmospheric attenuation uh, where you can see these windows kind of around 100, 150. This one centered around 250 and 350 and then one above 400. So these windows with periodic uh, absorption by water, oxygen, various things. Um, but if you start to kind of look at what's available, um, so here at this D-band, just for example, you've got here's a 49 gigahertz chunk of potential bandwidth, 2930. So this is what's got people so excited, obviously. And this is just the ability to do these wide band signal, signal uh, broadcasting. Um, the other big thing is just the size, um, the fact that if you take a 60 gigahertz antenna, it might be an inch by inch, whereas if you go to 300 gigahertz, now it's kind of in the order of millimeters. And, um, and now you can start to think about putting this into consumer devices. And so there's been a lot of interest in, in, in the, this ability to have this, this much smaller antenna size. Um, so for, uh, for uh, VDI, um, test and measurement uh, above is kind of one of our key focuses. So if you're going to develop, we, we've got these uh, kind of commercial applications ranging from this concealed weapons detection, weather forecasting, chemical biological hazards, the 6G communication. In order to develop these applications, we need this test and measurement equipment, and it really needs to be better than the devices instruments being developed, better 
in terms of say bandwidth or lower distortion, better, less, lesser intermodulation, higher power. And so, so, so that's been kind of one of our, uh, prime focus is how to test this. So if we look at test and measurement above 100 gigahertz, the testing requirements, there's a large variety of test devices to test from packaged to on wafer, differential, over the air testing. Um, also a, a wide variety of measurements and these are pretty much just matching what's being done now up to uh, 100 gigahertz, um, S parameters, noise figure, various distortion and uh, the, the Type measurements, intermodulation type measurements, and EMC for looking at uh, emissions. Um, and so the, these tests are routinely performed at microwave frequencies. So the signal generators, spectrum analyzers, spectrum network analyzers. So how do we extend these these up to these higher frequencies? And that's what I mentioned earlier with sources. But here's an example of a terahertz spectrum analyzer extender. Um, so it's really based on these high sensitivity mixers, very similar to what I showed for that satellite, the ice cube instrument, um, basically the same technology, shocky diodes mounted in waveguide housings. We use these uh, amplified multiplier chains where we use kind of pre-multipliers, these amplifiers like the Teledyne amplifier that I showed to generate a good clean local oscillator signal for this receiver. Um, we then end up with this high sensitivity mixer um, and that high sensitivity, what that allows you to do is get very uh, low uh, displayed average noise levels. So up to 750 gigahertz, we're at minus 150 dBm per hertz, um, and all the way up to 1.1 terahertz at minus 135. And you can actually even in improve that to about minus 165 dBm per hertz at some of the lower bands and where that's of interest for uh, people measuring um, emissions uh, want to be able to test to very small signal levels, and so this really helps speed up that emissions testing a lot to have that very low displayed average noise level. Um, these, uh, the other thing that's important is wideband signals are the key. So the, these uh, mixers have very wide IF bandwidths, up to 40 gigahertz or even higher. Generally, it's limited by things like the coaxial connectors or things like that. And relatively small compact form factors. So you can see an example here on the right where you could actually put that on a probe station or mount that inside of an over the air testing chamber or something like that. And so you can measure spectrum up at these terahertz frequencies, just like you do down at lower frequencies and measure phase noise and, and things like that. Um, so terahertz wideband signal generation detection, this is one of the main interests for kind of the 6G field, also radar. Um, there's a lot of interest, I, I, I mentioned um, radar earlier, but the collision avoidance radar is really moving up in frequency as well, pushing up to 100 gigahertz largely again because of this uh, antenna size where just the reduced antenna size really helps with that. Um, but for these digital communications, for these radar applications, you really want wideband signals or what they wanna look at. Um, complex modulation schemes, kind of various uh, kind of 16 or 64, or whatever QAM, the the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing OFDM type signals, um, with channel bandwidths uh, being up to 10 gigahertz or even wider, being of interest to look at. Um, traditional frequency multipliers, you can generate high terahertz power, but they distort these wideband signals since. Uh, the key problem is frequency multiplication is also a phase multiplication. And so you get an expansion of your, your signal, um, either the frequency or phase of that signal. And so you kind of lose out um, on, uh, uh, you generate a, a very carefully modulated signal and then you just expand it and you're kind of losing the ability to, to squeeze in the high data rates in a, in a narrow bandwidth. Um, there's also a nonlinear amplitude transfer amplitude transfer function, where if you send in a, an on-off keyed signal, it'll pass through this device, but if you send in a subtle amplitude modulation, it, it really acts as a pulse sharpener, and so, so you don't get a very good faithful reproduction of, a, of an amplitude uh, modulation through this. So we've developed these uh, up and down converters um, with the goal being to kind of have the minimum distortion, minimum intermodulation for these wideband signals, trying to have low conversion loss to get this high signal to signal to noise. Um, so signal detection is relatively simple. Um, for this, um, you take this millimeter wave modulated signal, feed it into the receiver. You have a signal generator, which uh, generate 
goes into this up converter, generates the local oscillator signal, and then that gets down converted uh, into the IF, and you get an accurate reproduction of the of this wideband signal at your IF output, and you can amplify it, and so you kind of you take the conversion loss of the mixer, reamplify it up, and so you can get reasonable signal uh, strengths out of this. So signal detection, pretty straightforward. For signal generation, things become a little more complicated. Um, we just essentially turn this case around, use the same mixer, same local oscillator, um, but in this case, we actually send in some modulated signal in the IF input um, from either, say, an arbitrary waveform generator or some sort of a vector, vector signal generator, feed that into the mixer's IF board in this case, and then we generate the uh, copies of these signals um, one of the challenges that the mixers at these frequencies are still relatively crude, so they're um, very often just uh, uh, double sideband mixers, uh, not, say, balanced or sideband separating mixers. That's something that, that is being worked on, but, uh, but, but, but for cases where we don't have that, um, we use this, uh, uh, these double sideband mixers. So you end up with an upper sideband and a lower sideband copy of your signal. Um, and for many applications, that's fine. You can do very nice measurements with that. Um, but there are a lot of cases where people really would like to um, to generate just a single copy of, of that signal up in the terahertz. And so for that, uh, obviously, what you do is throw in a bandpass filter. So you want to knock out, say, the lower sideband, pass through the upper sideband. You might also use that to block, say, some LO leakage, which uh, is often a small signal but can be important and cause distortion in your signal. Um, so we take these, um, uh, this bandpass filter and knock that out and, and end up. And so what are these bandpass filters? Um, we use waveguide filters, again, largely because of the low loss um, the, um, and, and relatively high Q of these structures. I've shown some examples of some E bands, some 60 to 90 gigahertz filters in this graph here. Um, these are kind of about yeah, five centimeter long. These are pretty classic designs. If you look in Matai and Jones, you'll see uh, th these are pretty canonical designs of filters. Um, there are a lot of challenges at, at making these up at terahertz, just machining challenges. You, you need to make these with very high precision, uh, but we, we try to get this very high uh, out of band rejection to, to, to help uh, prevent uh, the, these unwanted signals from distorting your 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 analysis. So we've done um, a lot of these filters um, uh, for various 5G kind of proposed 5G and 6G bands, um, and we've even done a 600 gigahertz filter that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so um, so we now use this uh, bandpass filter to clean it up. But um, the signal level has, uh, you're, you've now taken the conversion loss hit um, and the loss of the filter. So you've got a reduced amplitude copy of your signal out up at terahertz. And so now we add the amplifiers in to bring that signal level back up to give you a useful test signal up at these frequencies. Um, and again, for these amplifiers, this is the same amplifier I mentioned before, the same type of amplifier. These are these kind of medium power amplifiers. This is that same WR6 110 to 170 amplifier, where you can see we had 17 to 18 dB of, of saturated output power. But it, for this application, what's most important is generally the either P1 dB or, or often to get the best uh, uh, EDM or the l lowest distortion, you want to be more at the 0 0.1 dB uh, compression level, and so even lower than this. Um, and so by using these, we can then boost up the power and, and, and again, get uh, quite a bit higher signal level um, at, at the output of this, this sig the, uh, out of the system with a good clean um, uh, distortion. So I'll talk briefly about this. I think there'll be a, a, an upcoming lecture by uh, Greg Jew, uh, on, which will go into much more detail about this, but I'll just show a few quick results and then move on and, and leave it to Greg to kind of give a more detailed description of the work that Keysight's been doing on these sub terahertz test beds for 6G research. Um, but this kind of puts together a lot of the different aspects that I showed earlier. Um, you can see a couple of these co a compact up converter in this lower picture, compact down converter. The amplifier with uh, kind of just uh, in the middle there with that blue cable running over to the box. In this case, there's an attenuator to set the power level to look at 
uh, uh, to, to avoid compressing the, the receiving mixer. Um, you've got driving this, you've got an arbitrary waveform generator to generate this wideband IF signal, a uh, local oscillator to feed into these mixers to, to give you the, um, uh, to, to provide a good clean uh, 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 signal to mix off of, and then a, in this case, a very fast uh, oscilloscope here to take the data and analyze the data. Um, so again, just a couple examples. Um, uh, again, this, there'll be a lot more detail about this in, in the future talk. Um, but this is an example of a 16 quam measurement at 144 gigahertz. So you can see the, the, the signal here and kind of the center of this uh, uh, screen grab on the right. Um, and so this is basically a simulated radio measurement using these up and down converters. This was for a channel bandwidth around four gigahertz and EVM was uh, uh, close to 2%. So that's actually quite respectable EVM. Um, measurements all the way up to 64 quam showed similar performance uh, in, the, in that case. Um, and then you can think about these kind of extreme bandwidths. So 10 gigahertz of occupied bandwidth. This is a 16 quam measurement. So here you see things, uh, you can't quite see the EVM on the right, but it was around just below 5%. So, so starting to, to get a little, little ugly there, but we're working to improve these. Um, these were using these G-band converters, and again, measurements were done all the way up to 128 quam with some reduced performance. Okay. Um, so then finally, um, I'll go ahead and the, the last topic will be Terrett's vector network analyzers, and then I'll move on to the conclusion. Um, so the network analyzers, um, uh, we, our goal is to extend these uh, lower frequency uh, VNAs up into the terahertz range. Um, and so this schematic here kind of shows how that's done. You take, uh, so for example, on the top row, you take the uh, signal coming from the vector network analyzer, you feed that through an amplifier, some pre-multipliers, and then, or some multipliers, and then you've now got a terahertz signal, and then you have a sampling uh, directional coupler. Oh, well, let's see, oh yeah, a sampling directional coupler to sample the outgoing wave, a, a back reflecting coupler to, to do the measurement. And you've got these two uh, mixers that then down convert the signal back. And then the, this reference and measurement IF frequencies are both fed back in for analysis in, by the vector network analyzer. And then there's also a local oscillator signal very similar to the spectrum analyzer extender uh, schematic that I showed before to feed both of these mixers. And so if we think about what's inside the spectrum network analyzer extender, it's really, all the components I've been talking about. So here's an amplified multiplier chain, these heteron mixers like the one in the ice cube, these are local oscillators uh, are also another, just a multiplied uh, amp combination of shocky diode multipliers with these uh, amplifiers. Um, so uh, using these, we've been able to extend the, um, the uh, capability of these VNAs into the terahertz range. Um, we have uh, terahertz extenders being used up to 1.5 terahertz. We've got actually, uh, this is graph is already a little behind the times. We've now got actually dynamic range of 120 D up to 750 gigahertz now uh, through some recent advances in both the extenders and also in the base uh, VNA extenders with the excellent new phase noise in, in the, the new um, uh, key site uh, vector network analyzers. And so this is the example of the test port power, uh, something like uh, 14, 15 dBm typical over the band for one of our WR6 VNA extenders. And um, the uh, dynamic range of around 120 dB, in this case limited by the the uh, the base vector network analyzer where that's its, its uh, it, it can only achieve 120 dB dynamic range. Um, so one of the things uh, shown here is the this relative size of this extender, which may not seem too important, um, but but so the front face of this extender is one and a half high by three inches wide, about nine inches long, and um, so this uh, so so why do we care about size? What ends up um, uh, this is really key, particularly for on wafer testing, where this compact form factor enables you to get close down to your wafer. So Traditionally, if you have large extenders, you might have to have long waveguide runs, adding a lot of loss, uh, but that eats into the, the, uh, the ability of your, your extender to measure. It, it, it eats into your um, base directivity of the VNA extender. Uh, each 
every dB of loss here, pretty much uh, you lose twice that in the directivity of the system. So it really can hurt the stability and overall performance of your extender. Um, the other key issue is you want to get high test port power because people are wanting to test devices on wafer, not just S parameters, but really test compression um, uh, or nonlinearity or or uh, or drive an amplifier high enough uh, to, to, to get uh, full output power out. And so the higher test port power is, is helped by having uh, turning these uh, kind of heads that you can see in this lower picture where form factor has turned these heads kind of 45 to, to really reduce the amount of distance between the extender and getting on wafer. Um, and so I'll give an example now um, done by Mori with a company Vertigo. Um, and this is actually on wafer load pull. Um, this was some work done a year or so ago. Um, so in this case, uh, using these new extenders with the higher power uh, enables you to um, uh, do load pull measurements. These are synthetic load pull. So where you're using kind of the active load pull uh, by changing the, the amplitude and phase of the signal, you can kind of uh, simulate being at any point around the Smith or a reasonable number of points around the Smith chart using this, the more, but the more power you have, the more ability you have to cover the entire Smith chart. And so they've been able to do this non 50 ohm characterization and modeling all the way up to 1.1 terahertz using these type of approaches. And in the lower left, I've shown some measurements of a silicon germanium 130 nanometer HBT at around 125, 125 gigahertz, where you can see the, the Smith chart, the contours, um, the gain, PAE contours, and so able to do these measurements uh, like, like are done down at microwave frequencies and really extend these up uh, to do this load pull measurement up at, uh, into the terahertz range. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so here's a, a closer in view here. Um, so here you can see the input power, uh, RF input power, the the um, the, the, uh, the these uh, contours here, and then the uh, PAE and the gain gain curves here. Um, and then finally, I'll go ahead and show testing. This is I mentioned higher frequency filters. Um, we used a filter like this and radiometer similar to one that I described earlier for Ice Cube. Um, we uh, are using this to block side lower sideband noise. Um, in this case, this is actually a polarimeter where we take the signal coming in from space uh, or from the atmosphere, uh, more likely in this case, through an ortho mode transducer into two polarizations. And then we have these filters to single sideband uh, these these mixers um, after the amplifiers. Uh, in this case, these are Northrop Grumman amplifiers that we used. Um, Again, the same kind of a classic multipole filter, but in this case now our waveguide is only 85 microns high. We've got these very small irises. And so we were really uh, fighting to try to achieve the accuracy we needed to obtain the, to kind of have the filter hit the right frequency because we need to set these edges pretty accurately. And these are machined using standard CNC milling machines. And so here's the measured versus simulated filter performance where you've got the simulation is the dashed lines and then the solid lines are the measured. Um, and uh, when it was as measured, there was a slight shift. And basically by uh, by essentially kind of changing the width of the waveguide by, by about a micron, we were able to get this really nice alignment. So that so even a micron or, or so can really make a significant shift in this. Um, this was either related to kind of the accuracy of the machining of the depths or the flatness or maybe the flatness of the surfaces, keeping the blocks a little bit apart uh, more than we were expecting. Um, we measured multiple filters. Um, so here you can see the same basic filter, but what we had, we, these are five different filters. Two of them you can are kind of shifted a little higher than the other three. Um, we think this was just something in the machining where um, these three were maybe machined one day and the other two the next, and the machine had drifted a little bit between those. But so, so, uh, so, um, but these very small uh, uh, changes in size can really change the performance. Um, but again, we were able to using this to to achieve uh, uh, enough of a um, uh, accurate uh, response to be able to knock out the lower sideband, knock out the other leakage, and and do the science uh, for this particular case. Um, 
Oh, finally, I'll go ahead and end up with some calibrated measurements at WM250. We use classic lower frequency short open load through calibration method. Um, so precision load where we've got 50 dB or more kind of intrinsic uh, return loss of the load itself. The interface ends up dominating in that case. You're going to have interface reflections, quarter wave delay, and then the, so this is this milled quarter wave delay, and then just a short circuit for the short circuit standard. And using this, we can do this is just an example of a measurement of a one inch waveguide straight. Um, compared to a an ideal simulation with some some uh, increase due to surface roughness. So here we're at about 4 dB uh, for this one inch waveguide straight. So it's probably a little bit high at this frequency, but that's still reasonable. And you can see this dip at the high end, uh, dip at the low end. And if we look at the atmospheric losses here, um, oops, the frequency is not right here. So I grabbed the wrong graph. But um, you can see uh, up here at this 1.1 terahertz, there's a very strong water line here. And so if you plot the, the water absorption, and you can see that in green up at the top of the graph here, um, you can see this dip at the high end is really just the basically changing in, in the amount of water in this waveguide as the room temperature changes between the uh, the calibration. Oh, I guess it's basically the, the, the water absorption of the, the water inside the the one inch straight waveguide and the same down at this low end. And so there's water lines at 752, 986, and 1096 in this case. So, okay. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, so it, it's, uh, I feel it's a very exciting time for terahertz. There's, there's a lot of uh, new capabilities with these new transistors, really opening up the potential for commercial applications uh, in the terahertz particular this kind of 5G and 6G, there's uh, a lot of uh, discussion uh, uh, in the general uh, kind of semiconductor and, and instrumentation world on terahertz, and uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, new capabilities coming on, and our goal is to try to be able to uh, to enable people to measure these as, as accurately and, and rapidly as possible. So go ahead and stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. I was looking at. I don't see any questions. Maybe you just have a very outstanding presentation, <laughs> <laughs> and that it um, that you included everything. Awesome. I do want to remind everyone that if you do still later on have a question that you'd like Jeffrey to answer, you can send it. I put it. Excuse me. I put it right here in our chat box, um, where you can still send out a question if you have one later on. So again, uh, thanks go to Jeffrey Hessler for taking time out to enlighten us about terahertz technology, the move from scientific to commercial applications, 6G, space and more. Please stay tuned for our next upcoming webinar sometime next month. We're in the process with confirming dates and times with the presenters. So please make sure you visit our website to subscribe to our Washington Labs Academy to receive updates. This is easily done by visiting WLL.com. You're going to click that training tab in the upper right corner, and then you fill in your information where you see sign up for updates. So on behalf of the Washington Labs Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. I will now end the event. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and most importantly, please be safe. So until next time, bye, everyone. And again, thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks very much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye.